Okay, um, I'm Carol Vernon. This is my daughter, Anna, and Anna's been here at our church a lot longer than us. How many years? At least six. Okay. I mean, about six. And we moved here because she has my grandchildren, and I wanted to see them now. <laughs> it is a draw. And, yeah, it is. And uh, this is Leanne, and Leanne is Anna's birth mother. And um, she is so much more than that to us, but there's not a word for it. So, um, yeah. So we're here tonight to talk about the adoption story, and um, if um, well, I'll just say that I love adoption stories. And so, um, the last time we had one of these meetings, they said we need other uh, topic ideas, and I said, well, there's so many adoptive families in our church. Why don't we have some adoptive families tell their stories? Well, I think it would be me. I wanted it to be like, <laughs> I wanted it to be like, um, you know, the Statins or Van's story. And not, but here we are. So. <laughs> but, but this is God's story. And they asked me to go first, I guess, because my children are grown. And so you can see how they turned out. I don't know. <laughs> this is only one of them. <laughs> Um, let's see, where was I? Anyway, this is God's story. Um, and it started out because I was diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay. Um, it might have been the first time in my life that I couldn't control a situation. And I had to give God full control. And um, I learned so much from that. And um, I don't know if anybody in this room is going through infertility, but I know how painful it is. Um, at one point, I prayed, Lord, if you're not going to let me be a mom, then just let me die. And I really felt that way. And, um, you know, in the Bible, Rachel told Jacob, give me children or I'll die. And I know how she felt because that's exactly how I felt. Um, my friends knew that we were trying to have children and so they didn't want to tell me when they got pregnant. I can't imagine what it would be like in this church. <laughs> you know, um, but I remember one time uh, watching two of my friends exchange maternity clothes in the church parking lot. And I didn't know that she was pregnant. And I was so excited for her, but at the same time, uh, it just broke my heart um, for me, you know, because I wanted that too. Um, so I told Mike, the next Mother's Day, we're going to the beach, and I'm just going to pretend it's not Mother's Day. I can't do this again. But God <laughs> had other plans. Um, we had decided to work with a Christian adoption agency in Columbus, Georgia. We filled out mounds of paperwork. We were fingerprinted. We were interviewed. We went to parenting classes. We had to get city water instead of well water. All the things that birth parents don't have to do, but adoptive families do. And the expected cost would be $10,000. And it's probably a lot more than that right now because that was, you know, 30 years ago. <clears throat> um, we got a call in late March from a youth pastor we knew, and he knew that we were trying to adopt. And a teen mom at his church had a baby in October and when I was unable to keep the child. Four other couples wanted to adopt this baby. On April 7th, the day after my birthday, we got the call that we were chosen to be this child's parents. And we were to receive her on April 11th. So we had four days notice. <laughs> on top of that, my husband, who never worked nights, that week he had to work nights because, I don't know, something they were doing special at work. So I worked in the day and he worked at night. We didn't even see each other that week. So over the phone, we decided on a name, um, tried to pull together a bed and diapers and a video. Oh, back then, you know, you had a video camera. So, you know, Friday night we went and bought a video camera and decided on a name and Saturday morning we went and got her. And um, um, it was a private adoption, so it cost a tenth of the agency adoption. And that was another God thing because it allowed us to have money for another adoption. Um, so that's something else that God did in our story. We didn't know at the time, I'll, I'll tell y'all, this is a quilt. Um, Leanne's mother, Elaine, is here tonight. And this is a quilt that she made. She's made one for every grandchild. Mm -hmm. 
And she made, she even made me and my mom one for Risa, right? Uh-huh. And I really don't know how many she's made. <laughs> I know she's made one for each one, but also she gave my mom and I one. And so to me, this is just representative of how God has patched and weaved our families together. Um, I didn't know this, but I, I had met Leanne before. Um, Mike and I were uh, youth coaches at our church, and one night we went out. You know, they used to have visitation, and you go out and invite people to church. And so one of the boys in our youth group had a real crush on Leanne and wanted to go invite her to church. And we found her, I don't know how, we went to your house or something, and they said, well, she's at the football field. So we went to the football field, and she was probably watching somebody else, but my Matt wanted to go witness to her, so we did. And so I met her, I knew her. And, um, and I, I, found, I realized that in the adoption process. Um, but um, so I knew her family. I knew they were a beautiful Christian family, and they wanted the same um, for this little baby. You want to talk about your side of this? So I was born in Georgia, but at, I'm Leanne, by the way. Um, I was born in Georgia, but as a military family, we moved around a lot growing up. I got really good at being the new kid, and in high school, that looked like bad decisions trying to fit in. I was rebellious and believed that freedom meant doing whatever felt good. My parents were divorced, so when I couldn't sit still, I moved from one parent's house to the other, and finally my senior year, I moved into an apartment with, some, with a friend that was already graduated. I compromised everything I was raised to believe, and it wasn't long before I discovered that I was pregnant. I walked my high school graduation five months pregnant and just knew that I had disappointed everyone and I allowed the seed of failure to be planted in my heart. On October 28, 1991, I gave birth to Leah Michelle Ellis. It's <laughs> my the second paragraph. <laughs> um, thanks. The most beautiful girl I had ever seen. I would moved back home until she was born and then once again set out to find that freedom I was looking for. I had no humility and was still wrapped in the, wrapped in the passions of my youth. For months, I attempted to be a mother, but found myself continually coming up short. After months of couch surfing and continuing in my rebellion, I was presented with the idea of adoption, and it seemed like the best way I could love my daughter. Even before I knew the Lord or what he had planned, I never once doubted that adoption was the right decision. Once the decision was made and all the papers were signed, I went to my parents to wait for the people to come pick up the baby. The details of that day are a blur, but the one thing I remember is that I've never felt lonelier than I did standing there with empty arms. Sorry. <laughs> I could not conceive of the plans that God would have for us years down the road, but at the time I was not prepared for the emotional anguish that would follow. I was so lost in my own pain, I could not bear the thought of how my choices had affected my family. They lost a grandchild, they lost a niece. I'd already been experimenting with drugs, so I jumped at the first thing that I thought would take away the pain. That was the beginning of a nearly 15 year journey into the depths of sin-saturated living and drug addiction. Back to you. <laughs> um. So, um, we, we had a relationship with um, an adoption agency, and I told you that we went through classes, and those classes were actually very beneficial. Um, and one of the things that they shared with us was the importance of praying for your birth mother. And so, um, we always did that, and we, we did it with Anna every night. Um, when we prayed with her, but in my private prayers, I also prayed that when Anna met, when and if Anna met her, 
that she would be a believer, that she would be a strong Christian. Um, and I knew growing up, um, because of the pastor who knew we wanted to adopt and got us connected, became our pastor, uh, moved to our church and became our pastor, and I sort of kept up with what was going on with Leanne through them. And um, we prayed harder, because you know they would tell us how she was doing. And, um, but God knew, and he knew when they were gonna meet, and, um, and he knew what it was gonna look like. And I have to say, <laughs> Here that I mean Anna prayed for Leanne and we did but her mom I know and her family the prayers that come from your mom and those were the prayers that that got her back to God back to Jesus so, um, and then Anna do you want to talk about growing up how it was growing up adopted and sure so yeah, I think I can, I would say that my parents handled adoption really with a lot of wisdom and care, and it was never a big surprise moment to me that I was adopted, so I don't even remember, you know, I just always knew that I was adopted, um, and with that came a lot of questions about just who am I, you know, what, where is my identity, and mom and dad faithfully always pointed me to Christ and, and I wasn't even asking those questions out loud to them I was just kind of internalizing them um, but just faithfully instructing us in the word of God having us memorize scripture Psalm 139 has always been so precious to me that you know you formed my inward parts and you knit me together in my mother's womb and so I remember reading that thinking you know who my mother was you know you knew who I was even then um but I, um, you know, even when I hated them for not letting me know the whole story because they were protecting me, um, I wanted to meet her and I knew enough to know that they had connections somehow to her. Um, but they knew that it was, a, I think, a burden too heavy for me to carry as a child. And so I remember kind of sneaking in my dad's closet. And I knew he had some hide and holds and different things. So I'd be looking <laughs> in his drawers and... You know, I knew there was a picture, and I knew there was a piggy bank, and you know, some things, mementos that I would go searching for, and I think I may have stumbled across something here or there when I was younger, but um, they ultimately, I think, were trusting the Lord with with the timing for that, and um, I don't know how y'all decided, but it was, you know, you just said, when you turn 18, um, you know, you can have that decision for yourself, but up to that point. I think they didn't know enough about where Leanne was, um, and they didn't have her direct contact, so it was through my 18th birthday that I didn't have any contact. And so I, I think the Lord really kept me in, in his grace, and um, I um, was saved at a really early age, and he, they raised me in the Word. And so I really, I mean, I had those identity questions, that, but it didn't really impact my outward behavior that much um there was definitely the rebellion years of just being a teenager and wanting to make my own decisions and not being fully mature to do that yet um so there was some resentment there and resentment toward mom especially because i think in my mind i thought well she's jealous because you know my my real mom or my you know my biological mom is out there and so i kind of Set her up as the enemy for a lot of that time, um, but but I'll say about that that I just thought it was teenage rebellion. I didn't think anything about it being you know connected to her adoption, and I think a lot of it was. And I don't and it wasn't you know terrible teenage rebellion. It was just normal you know um, I think and. Um, Um, back to what maybe what's happening with you in the meantime we well let me say something right here so when Anna when when did Christina speak were you 18 then I think we're going to get to that in a minute but yeah I was a senior in high school uh -huh. and so I'm going to introduce the next part by telling that is that okay oh. so when 
when Anna was 18, there was a lady at our church, and um, she came and spoke and told her adoption story. She was, uh, she was a birth mother, and she released her child for adoption, and they reunited, and she came and told the story. And Anna came home and said, I want to meet my birth mother. And so that was the point where I knew she's old enough and she's determined enough that we need to do it. And so. Yeah, what, what was interesting, I think, too, is I remember hearing this lady's story. And, yeah, she was the biological mother, and she shared her end of all those years of praying and crying and just the guilt she carried um, and, and not knowing what her biological daughter was thinking of her and you know, her concern was I never left her. I never abandoned her. My, my, my hope was something better and more for her than what I could give. And so I remember sitting in that class my senior year of high school and thinking, I need my birth mom to know that I don't resent her at all. And, that, you know, that I've been well kept and well loved and I can't imagine living anywhere else. And um, so that was kind of my, the Lord just, it was his timing. You know, it was like I just got this urge all of a sudden that she needs to know that, the Lord has his hand on this. Um, so that's kind of what, what prompted me. Carol said the other night, I, I said, well, I'm just, you know, I was your basic rebellious teenager. And she said, I think you're a little more than basic, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's probably right. And I'm pretty sure my own mother would agree. Um, so by December of 2005, I made a thorough mess of my life. I had two more children, two more adoptions, in and out of rehab and jail. You name it, I probably did it. I was addicted to meth and living in the office of an automotive shop that was used as a drug front. I've been laying on the couch for three days with no food, no utilities, no people, no drugs, no love, no hate, no hope. I was too weak to walk and I had no phone to call for help. All I had was the shame of my existence and an overwhelming desire to stop existing. On the third night, a guy showed up at the shop and asked if I wanted to go to church the next morning. Church. The same guy was just here using drugs with me last week and now he wants to go to church. So in hopes of getting a ride out of there, I said sure, but we needed to stop by the bar first. I had every intention of ditching this guy and finding a way to feed my addiction. That night at the bar, a man I had known over the years was there to shoot pool, and so I asked if I could go to his house to get cleaned up. I meant, like, take a shower. Um, but God had other plans. Many people had been praying for a moment of clarity, and that in that moment I would make the right decision. My friend agreed to let me go to his house. That moment was coming. Before going to his house, I asked him to take me back by the shop so I could get a few things. When we arrived, he stayed in the car and I walked down the hill to the office where I had been living. There were four guys sitting in the office with a pile of meth and I was literally undone. This is what I had been waiting for. Oddly, panic took over as I assessed the situation. Any other day, this would be an easy decision. Get rid of the guy offering a way out and stick around for the party. I felt as if I was literally being torn in two by this decision. I did not know at the time, but the spiritual battle for my soul was on. I had gone toe to toe with the enemy and the world had chewed me up and spit me out. But God had enough and he drew a line. And I believe that night in the shop in Forest Park, Georgia, he told Satan that is enough. You cannot have her. It stops here. Terror of the unknown suddenly raged through me. I knew what to expect if I stayed at the shop. But for the first time, I considered what might be if I chose something else. I turned my back and walked out the door, and by the grace of God, have never used meth again. <laughs> the turmoil in my guts made the short walk back up the hill seem like a thousand miles. I was so fragile, but I was drawn. When we were about to pull out of the parking lot, I stopped him and said I needed to go back in for just one second, just one second. It was like the entire universe stood still as this discerning, soft-spoken man got in my face and told me this was my crossroads. He explained that I may not have another chance, that this was my moment. 
Of course, I did what anyone would do in that situation, and I slapped him across the face as far as I could. <laughs> but he did not miss a beat. I believe that he understood how to stand firm and having done all to stand. I squeezed my eyes tight and said, step on it and get me out of here. I finally got that shower. <laughs> After several days of crying, sleeping, and eating on repeat, my, my friend came to me with a proposal. He said I was welcome to stay at his house on the condition that I would go to church. There was that word again. I asked if he had checked with the church to make sure it was okay to bring me because I was pretty sure they did not want someone like me around. I was foul-mouthed, scrawny, dirty, stringy hair, unlovable heathen with nothing to offer, and besides, wasn't church for good people? Through his chuckle, he assured me that is not how it works and that I would be welcomed. Since I had nothing better to do and nothing to lose, I agreed. When I walked into the church building, I felt like everything I had ever done was written all over my face. No amount of dressing up could change the feeling that I was inside out and see-through. Much to my shock and amazement, the people at that church were kind and welcoming. They hugged me, and I wondered if they had any idea what kind of person they were touching. They were so clean, and I felt so dirty. They did not want anything from me, and I had nothing to give. The more time I spent around these church people, I began to see the something I was missing was peace. I was desperate to find that for myself. They told me to get a Bible and read it. Even if it didn't make sense, read it anyway. Over the next few weeks, I read that Bible, and it might as well have been written in Greek because it didn't make a lick of sense to me. <laughs> One day, my friend, the same friend, his 79-year-old uh, mother, sounds about this tall to me, um, came by to visit me. No hello, no small talk. She just walked right in, looked me in the eye, and said, if you died right now, do you know where you would spend eternity? I was speechless, like, who asks that question? <laughs> um, every single argument for heaven ran through my mind, but none of them produced an answer I could stand on. I told her that I didn't know. She asked if she could show me in the Bible how to be saved, and I agreed. Here was that moment of clarity when I was faced with my true spiritual condition. I needed no convincing of my sin. Every verse on the Romans road resonated, but when she got to Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I realized that I was never going to be able to do it. I was never going to be able to clean myself up and be presentable. Only the blood of Jesus could do that. I asked Jesus to save me that day, and nothing has ever been the same. Praise God. <laughs> so do y'all want to tell about the Christina Holly part and how you guys met? You want to go back? Yeah, you go. You go. Okay. You got it. I'll just keep rolling. <laughs> We really could spend all night here, but I know you have babies and husbands and stuff. And I do too, so. Um, so we all know that this is such a special time of year. So I want to share about one more life-changing December. During the 2009 Christmas season, a lady came to share her testimony at a ladies' Christmas dinner at my church. She told about how she was saved as a girl and got off track and had a baby in high school that she placed for adoption. She grieved for this child for 20 years. She told how during a Bible study, her mentor prayed this bold prayer that she would be reunited with her daughter. A week later, her daughter called her. This was such a beautiful story of redemption, and I was absolutely thrilled and amazed at how God fulfilled her heart's desire. Eight days later, as I sat at my work desk, my phone rang, and the sweetest voice on the other end said, Hi, this is Anna. I'm your daughter. My heart started doing flips. I was blown away. I mean, I just heard this testimony, and of course, as soon as I 
does your mother know you're calling me? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what this lady said in her testimony. I figured that was the appropriate. <laughs> so, um, and then I was like, you're never going to believe what happened. This lady came to my church and she took, and so Anna says, is her name Christina? And and I said, yes, it is. You know her. Oh. And this is when we realized that the same lady had given her testimony at two different places <laughs> and time. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> So Anna thanked me for thanked me for what I had done for her because she loves her life. She told me that she loves me and that she wanted to meet me. Of course, we chose Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> we talked for hours. Um, the waitress even came over and said, I don't know what's going on, but it feels like something big is going on. <laughs> and we're like, yes, it is. Um, we studied our hands and our noses and other features, looking for similarities and finding many. She knew that I was not sure who her biological father was, and she wanted me to know that she was okay with that. What amazing grace. She loves Jesus and has turned out to be far more than I ever could have thought to pray for. And as if that wasn't fantastic enough, I had the pleasure of hearing her valedictorian speech in person. I got to help her pack for college, chat late into the night just sitting in her driveway, visit her dorm room, text message entire books to each other, complete with proper punctuation and spacing. <laughs> but if you could see that feed, oh my goodness. Um, becoming part of Anna's life and family has blessed me in countless ways. And one was when Anna's daddy, a man of extremely few words, approached me at, on her wedding day, tears filling his eyes. He said he was fine until he saw me. Then he began to tell how they had prayed for me through the years as if I was their own. I know the Lord coupled these prayers with the ceaseless prayers of my own mother and used them to snatch me from the fires of hell. I never doubted my decision to place Anna for adoption, but right then I was given the precious gift of knowing exactly how God made all of my grief count for something, as I saw in Anna's daddy's eyes the love of a father for his daughter. I'm thankful for Carol and how gracious she has been to include me in the special moments in Anna's life. I'm thankful to Anna for her desire and willingness to cultivate a relationship with me and let me into her life. One of the greatest joys I will treasure in my heart always is locking arms with Carol in the delivery room. <laughs> While Anna, under the fine coaching of Cody Marsh, brought, <laughs> <laughs> brought Miss Risa Jane into the world. <laughs> so I want to close my part of the evening sharing how thankful I am to Jesus for his redeeming love. He is and always will be enough. On April 13th, 2013, I welcomed Miss Sophie Ty into the world, and I am so humbled that the Lord is allowing me to experience the joy of motherhood. The Lord also saw fit to reunite me with my other two children and have given me two extra children. No more timely words were shared with me as what Carol shared with me at my baby shower from Joel 2, 25 and 26. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Never stop praying to see God do what seems impossible. So um, tonight, before we spoke, we were praying. And there are so many aspects to this story, um, primarily salvation and redemption. Um, you guys thought you were going to hear an adoption story tonight, and you did. But, you know, you also heard a story of, of what God can do in anybody's life, no matter where they are. Um, and so our prayer was that if somebody here is not saved, doesn't know the Lord, that they would tonight. And so, if there's anybody here tonight who doesn't know the Lord, please talk to some, any of us before you leave. Um, don't, don't leave. Um, also, you know, if you're considering adoption, um, I hope this has encouraged you. <laughs> um, 
all stories aren't this Pollyanna, all adoption stories are not this Pollyanna, but all of them, to me, are God stories. And um, adopted children struggle, you know, with identity and uh, with trauma and, um, you know, their genes are not the same as yours and it will show up. Um, sometimes in beautiful ways, because <laughs> yeah. um, um, yeah. um, but um, I don't know if what, I don't know if you've given birth to ten biological children or you have five adopted children or a mix. God is the ultimate family planner, and so you can trust Him in that. And um, my my thing. Um, as an adoptive mom is he gives the barren woman a home making her the joyous mother of children praise the Lord mm -hmm. and that's what he did for me and I know that um, there are other mothers in this room who are adoptive moms and I know that might not, your adopted child might not have, not have been your first one but they are just as precious so. mm -hmm. mercy and I thank you for your grace Lord I thank you for every word that was spoken here and and Lord our whole our whole reason for being here is to make much of your name and I just pray for every lady here and every person in their sphere father that you've given them a word tonight that they can take with them and that you will work into their hearts Lord to encourage them and to direct them toward you and and Lord that they will know that they are so loved and so wanted and so desired by you, Father. And I just pray that um, as women, we will continually walk worthy of the calling that you've put on our lives mm -hmm. to seek you first, Lord. And all these things will be added to us. We thank you for this night of fellowship and of worship together. And we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the cross and we thank you for the resurrection. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do we have time for a P.S.? Yeah. <laughs> Anna asked Anna said she was going to ask me this and she didn't and I think it's important um, she asked me she wanted to ask me so how did you word it oh what was your experience of um, meeting her yeah how did I feel about Anna meeting Leanne and I think that's a big question for a lot of people so I wanted to address that because we forgot but um Anna was a teenager, and she was um, she was a very devoted Christian and believer. But but you know she was rebellious too, and and we were at a stage in our relationship where we weren't really getting along well. Um, and so um, I wasn't afraid for her to meet Leanne, but I also thought she might be going in seeing Leanne with rose-colored glasses, you know. But I did know that when I called our contact to find out how to get in touch with Leanne for Anna, that she said, you won't believe this. She said, um, I talked to Leanne recently, or she said, I heard from Leanne recently, and she said, and her testimony is, um, God didn't change my life, he gave me a new one. Mm -hmm. And so my prayer was answered that when Anna met Leanne, that she was a believer, that she knew the Lord. And so I was confident in that, that when she met Leanne, that Leanne knew the Lord. And um, I did tell Anna last week when we met that I thought, you know, that when she met Leanne, that she was going to claim her as her mom and move to Texas because she'd also, her and Cody thought about moving to Texas at some point. But I thought, you know, I really did think that, um, you know, she might just be enamored with Leanne because I was the mean old mom, y'all. I was the mean old mom. So, but it, it didn't turn out that way. We all love each other so much, and it's just a relationship like no other. I mean, she's not, she's a birth mother, but she's more. She's not an aunt. She's not, I don't, we don't know what to call it, but it's just, it's, it's, it's special. So, that was on my PS. Sorry. That's great. <laughs>